Hi, I'm Ross Gustafson, and this is Tesla Volta Games, the video channel about ironic names and great board games. Welcome to the how to play video of the base set of Twilight Imperium 3. If you're looking how to set up a game of the base set of Twilight Imperium 3, check the video description below for a link on the how to set up video. As well, you can look in our video channel and find the link there. Now, in this video, we're going to include all the rules for the base set of Twilight Imperium game of how to play a basic game, and not any of the variant or otherwise known as optional rules or the expansion rules for Twilight Imperium 3. With that in mind, let's get going. There is technically no limit to the number of rounds in the game. However, once someone draws the Imperium Rex card, scores an I win the game public objective, or reaches 10 victory points, the game is immediately over. The player who reaches 10 points scores a game winning card, or has the most points in the moment the Imperium Rex card appears, wins. There is a tie, and the person who has the greater number of objective cards completed, including secret objectives, wins. If there is still a tie, then the remaining tiebreakers happen in this order. Number of planets, number of unused command counters, number of total command counters on the player's race sheet. If still tied after these tiebreakers, then the game is simply tied. The game goes through three phases per game round. The strategy phase, the action phase, and the status phase. Each game round continues in these three phases until the game ends. Please note that if the Imperium Rex card appears in the action phase, the game ends immediately then, and does not continue and does not finish the rest of the game round. Same thing if a player completes an objective that states, I win the game. That means the game also immediately ends, and that player is the sole winner of the game. We shall begin with the strategy phase. If you're all set up, one player should have the speaker token already. That person will begin by selecting a strategy card from the common area, out of the eight strategy cards. Then each player will take clockwise turns to select a strategy card for themselves. In a six-person game, that means that two of the strategy cards will remain, and in a five-player game, three strategy cards will remain. In a three- or four-person game, each player will take two strategy cards and will select them just like in the setup how systems were placed on the board, in a snake-like pattern. The last person to select their first strategy card will be the first player to pick up their second strategy card, as the order of picking up the strategy cards is reversed. This helps balance out the game so the last person isn't punished for picking up the last strategy card in this crucial part of the game. You see, each of the strategy cards will determine both your playing order and special actions only you can take and are in control of. Once everyone has done selecting strategy cards, place a bonus token on each strategy card not taken. In a four-person game, since every card is used in every game round, you will not need the bonus tokens. When selecting your strategy cards, make sure they are face up on the active side of the card near your personal playing area. A couple of things to note. First is, if you pick up the strategy card in the game that has bonus tokens on them, you immediately exchange each bonus token for a free command counters to put on any of the three command areas, strategy allocation, fleet supply and command pool, or you can exchange a bonus token to put a trade good in your trade good area of your race sheet for later use. Finally, it is critical to understand that the turn order of the action phase is determined by the strategy cards number, not by the player who has the speaker token, and not in clockwise fashion. This could be all over the place. During the action phase, players will take many actions, and each action is done in order from the lowest number, this is the initiative number, to the highest number. If playing with three or four players, 
Each player has multiple strategy cards. Thus, their initiative order is determined by each player's lowest numbered card. The next phase is the action phase. This is where the bulk of the game is played. You have seen during the setup there are three areas on the race sheet for command counters for your race initially. The leftmost area is a strategy allocation area. This allows the player to use the secondary abilities of the of other players' strategy cards and to use special actions for certain races. The middle area is the fleet supply. This shows how many capital ships, basically any ship larger than a fighter, can have at one system at a time. The final and right side command counter area is the command pool. This is the area to use for building more units, moving to new systems, and transferring units between friendly systems. All three of these areas are important, and the use of the command counters is the lifeblood of the game for players. Without these counters, you will not be able to do many actions, and you will become stagnant. As mentioned before, the players play many turns in order from lowest initiative number to highest as per the strategy card. They continue this loop until everyone has passed. So if six players pick strategy cards one to six, the players will play an action each in that order. One going first and six going last until all players played an action and then player one would start another action and the cycle continues until all players have passed. Once a player has passed, all of the other players keep playing as many turns as they wish until the rest of them decide to pass. If a player passes, that player cannot do any more actions for the rest of the game round, but may choose to participate in secondary abilities of strategic cards if they wish to. They may also defend themselves if someone attacks them and vote if the political card is used. More on these type of actions in a moment. With these things in mind, let's look into the five different types of actions we can do in, during the action phase. The first type of action is the strategic action. This action allows the player to play the primary power of their strategy card. The player follows the instructions on the card and carries out the entirety of the primary power in order. Then, if the card has a secondary ability, that player who played the primary ability of the card reads aloud the secondary ability of the card and asks each other player in order of clockwise of the player who played the strategy card if they wish to exercise the secondary ability of the strategic action. The player who activated the primary power of the strategic card may never activate the secondary power unless they are provided a way to do so by some other means or are told by the strategic card if they wish. Most of the secondary powers will end up using a command counter from the strategic allocation to activate. So this is why it's important to have command counters in the strategic allocation area from round to round. Once each player has used the secondary ability or chosen to pass on using that ability, the player who activated the strategic card now flips the card over to inactive and that card will not be used for the rest of the game round. A player must play all of their strategic cards before passing in the game round. We will go over in detail what the eight different strategy cards in the base game are later in this video, once we fully understand how the game is played. Remember this, you cannot activate a secondary ability that requires a strategic command token if you have none in your strategic allocation area. The second type of action is the tactical action. This is the exciting part of the game for those who wish to conquer planets, systems, or just want to build massive fleets for intimidation or protection. The tactical action follows a simple set of steps, some of which can be skipped for different reasons, but are always done in the same order. These steps are, number one, activate a system. Number two, move ships into that system. Number three, resolve PDS fire. Number four, space battle. Number five, planetary landings, number six, invasion combat, and number seven, produce units. There may be at times where you may choose only to be producing units, moving units, or moving to land on a planet. However, the tactical action is done in the same order to do any of the tasks in the the sub-steps. To activate a system, simply take a command token from the command pool and place it on the system you wish to activate. You can only ever activate one system you wish to move to, produce from, etc. with one tactical action, no matter how many command tokens you may have. One activated system 
per tactical action. You must always activate a system to do a tactical action. You can never activate a system that is already activated by you, but multiple people can activate the same system once each. Now that you have activated a system, you may choose to move units from any other systems as long as they meet the following requirements. First, the unit has sufficient movement speed to reach the activated system. Movement speed for a unit can be found on the race sheet or the rule book. If you happen to have an older set of Twilight Imperium 3rd edition from an earlier print run, use the rule book due to the previous printing errors on older race sheets. On newer print runs, you do not have to make this adjustment. Movement corresponds to the number of systems a unit can move to reach its destination. A movement of one, for example, allows that unit to move only to the adjacent system. Of movement of two allows the unit to move past one system and into the activated system to move. There are technologies and other ways to increase movement, but generally the race sheet gives you the basic movement before upgrades. If you see a card or ability that is active that gives you plus one movement, simply add a movement when determining how far a unit can move. These abilities may become cumulative as the game continues. The unit has a path to go through unobstructed systems containing fleet units or by special systems that obstruct movements such as asteroids or supernovas. If only ground forces, fighters, or enemy unoccupied planets are in the way, your fleets can move through that system, provided they have the movement to reach their destination. Third, ships must not be coming from a system that was activated by that ship's player. Fourth, the ships must end their movement in the system you activated this turn. Ground forces and fighters can be picked up by units with capacity for them, like carriers and war suns. The capacity of how many units can be transported by a unit can be found on the race sheet. These units can be picked up along the way to the destination system. Ships are allowed to move through friendly systems that have already been activated by the player in an earlier turn in the game round. The number of capital ships, or non-fighter ships, may never exceed their fleet supply. The fleet supply is determined by the number of counters on the fleet supply area of the player's race sheet. Do remember, to make things more clear, always flip your command tokens for your fleet supply upside down to be clear your maximum fleet supply. You can never move units or build units in a way that will exceed your fleet supply. If for any reason the number of capital ships exceed your fleet, you must destroy those capital ships immediately before play continues, plus any units those ships were carrying. Generally, though, those moves are not allowed, so don't let other players move or build units if it will exceed their fleet limit, and instead let them rearrange their move or build so they continue to follow the rules. After moving units, it is time to check if the activated system has Planetary Defense Sentry Units, or PDS units for short, on any of the planets in the system. If so, resolve all PDS fire. PDS get one attack for each PDS unit on the planet. PDS do not fire if they are currently being transported by an enemy ship. They use the strength of an attack listed on their profile in the race sheet or the unit reference card. Attacking in Twilight Imperium is always the same. Take the strength of the unit attacking, in the PDS case is normally 7, and roll a single 10-sided die otherwise known as a D10, for each of those PDS units. If the roll is 7 or higher, the attack goes through, and the defender must lose a unit. However, anything lower than a 7, and nothing happens, and the attack fails. If the attack goes through, then, in the case of a PDS fire, a ship is destroyed. This can include fighters. The unit destroyed is always determined by the defender. Some units, like the Dreadnought of War Sun, have a special rule called Sustained Damage, which allows them to take a hit, be placed on their side, and keep fighting. If a unit with Sustained Damage takes another hit during the game round, is already on its side, and the defending player decides to place another hit on the Sustained Damage unit, then that unit is destroyed. Essentially, these units must have two successful attacks go through on them during the game round before they are destroyed. A unit can be issued sustained damage hit and the final death blow in the same round of fire or attacking. Once all the PDS fire has been resolved, it's time for space battles. All ships duke it out until one player stands as the victor. You must fight in a space battle if there are enemy ships in the system where your fleet flew into. Space battles are similar to PDS fire in the sense of how attacks are resolved. One player rolls 
dice for each ship unit. If the die roll is equal to the attack roll on the unit's profile, again found on the race sheet, then that roll counts as a hit. Keep doing this until each unit has attacked once. Then the other player gets to attack back in the same manner with their ships. Each player counts up how many hits were scored, and then each player must remove units or issue sustained damage equal to the number of hits the opponent rolled. Then another combat round begins in the same manner. This repeats until one side is out of ships, or both if damage simultaneously destroys both fleets. Remember, if a ship was carrying planet-only units like ground units, and that ship happens to be destroyed, then those units are also destroyed. Fighters can remain in space as long as there continues to be capacity for them during battle. Otherwise, they are destroyed as well. These rounds of firing and removing units are called rounds of space battles, or combat rounds. This is important to note for special rules later on. However, a player may choose at the beginning of one of these rounds of combat that it is in their best interest to leave the battle. They can announce a retreat, also known as a withdrawal, from combat at the beginning of the combat round. If they announce, the player suffers through one more round of shooting from the other player, and the player withdrawing cannot fire back. If the withdrawing player has ships that survived the space battle, then they can withdraw to an adjacent system, which has no enemy ships, and is a place the player is allowed to fly to, and has already been activated by the withdrawing player. This is key. It has to already have been activated by the withdrawing player before this current tactical action. Otherwise, the fleeing units are destroyed along with their carried units. If the attacker has successfully destroyed all of the enemy ships, or there were no ships to begin with, and want to place units on a pl to a planet for conquest or reinforcements, then the attacker may begin planetary landings on that planet, or the other planets in the system. First decide which of your units are going to land on the planet, or planets in the system. This must be determined first. Remember, you can place any unit on any planet in any configuration you choose. However, there are things to consider first, such as the type of units and type of landings you'll be making. There are three kinds of planetary landings. Hostile, neutral, or friendly. Friendly planetary landings are onto planets that are already under your control. You can place ground units, like ground forces and PDS, freely on the planet. Neutral planets are planets not owned by any person. You can land ground forces and take the planet, but cannot land PDS unless you have at least one accompanying ground force onto the same planet. Otherwise, the PDS is destroyed. Once your planet units have taken the planet, take the planet card for that planet from the planet deck and place it next to your race sheet with your other planets and show that the planet is exhausted. More on that in a few moments. The last type of landing is a hostile landing. This means the planet is owned by another player and you are attempting to take the planet from them. This triggers an invasion. If there is nothing on the planet other than the other player's flag, then the invasion is simple. Put your units on the planet, remove their flag, receive the planet card from the enemy player, and place it on your planet cards exhausted. Again, if the PDS is alone and the PDS is destroyed and the invasion fails, if the planet has any units, then invasion resolved in this order. First, planetary bombardment. Second, PDS fire. Third, invasion combat rounds. First, if the attacking player has ships capable of planetary bombardments, such as dreadnoughts and war suns, they can make attacks against the defenders. Dreadnoughts cannot fire their attacks if PDS are present on the planet. The planetary bombarding ships make one set of attacks each, one per dreadnought, and three per war sun, because war suns always get three attacks. PDS and space docks, since they are structures, do not get removed as casualties from these attacks. After the bombardment phase of the invasion combat happens, the defending PDS units get a chance to fire at the incoming ground units trying to invade. They get one round of fire per PDS on the planet, and casualties are taken against the ground units invading only. Do note, though, attacking player must be placing PDS units in the invasion with the ground units to successfully land PDS on the planet after invasion. If there are any more surviving attacking ground units invading after the PDS fire, then we do invasion combat rounds. Just like space battles, each player gets to attack with all their ground forces until one or both player's units are destroyed. Combat is just like space battles in rolling dice and using attack rolls 
for their respective units. Both players get to attack simultaneously. If at the end of an invasion combat round, the attacker is the only player with ground units left, he takes the planet by force, receives the planet card from the opposing player exhausted, destroys the opposing player's PDS and space dock units, and places their units on the planet. Otherwise, the planet remains with the defender. Once the invasion step is done for each planet in the system, the player may produce units. However, you cannot build units normally without a space dock, and you cannot build a space dock on a planet when you took that planet that game round. So why allow production now? This is because the tactical action can be done on a system you control to move units there and or to build if those planets can build units or space docks. A planet can produce units, but cannot lend their resources if they are exhausted. Production is fairly simple. You have planets, which usually start unexhausted at the beginning of each game round, and trade goods. You can build as many units as you want based on a few factors. You have a space dock that can produce units. You have just enough resources and trade goods available to build the units. You have production capacity to build those units. You have carrier capacity for fighters built. You have the fleet supply to hold all the capital ships in the system after production. You need space docks to build units normally and you need systems in your control at least a little while before you can build space docks on them. If you acquire a planet this game round, you cannot build a space dock on it, even if it is unexhausted. Also, you cannot build units on a system in which you built your space docks that game round. Facilities take time to get up and running, just like in real life. Each unit costs a certain amount of resources to build. This can be found in your player race sheet under the cost column for each of the different units. If you use plants or resources to build units, or do any other task requiring resources, you exhaust the planet. You put the number of resources for that planet into the pool of resources which you can use to produce only on this current tactical action. You can exhaust any of your planets in this way. It does not have to be the planet which is doing the production. Just place the pl exhaust the planets all in the same manner. Once the tactical action is over, any remaining unused resources on the exhausted planets are lost. The amount of resources you can use is the total number of resources of all planets you've exhausted this action, plus the number of trade goods you decide to use for this production on this turn. If you use trade goods for this reason, then you remove them from your trade your race sheet and place them into the common area as they have been spent. We have seen a concept called carrying capacity in the game so far, but there is a similar concept called production capacity. Production capacity is the number of units a system can produce during a single activation or production build. Each space dock, generally, before any in-game upgrades, has a production capacity of 2, plus the number of resources available on the planet that the space dock resides. This can be further enhanced by either technology or building other space docks in the same system. For example, if a system has two planets, with resource counts of one and two each, and contain two space docks, one on each of those planets, the total production capacity is four for the space docks, plus three for the resource counts combined of the planets, equaling seven units that system can build during a single production turn. A single planet of three resources with a space dock has only five production capacity. So production capacity can really limit you in how many units you can build, even if you're flush with planets and trade goods. Not only that, but you must have carrier capacity for fighters. You only have capacity for three fighters in a single space dock before you require carriers, war suns, or possibly other units which have upgrades for carrying fighters to host the excess fighters. Multiple space docks in a system increase this capacity by three for each space dock in a single system. Note that when you spend a resource to produce fighters at ground forces, you gain two fighters or two ground forces for the price of one. Again, you must follow the same rules for the number of units you can produce because of production capacity. This should be obvious, but ships are placed in space, ground units and space docks produced during production are placed on planets. So as you can see, there is a lot you can do on the tactical action. For many games, tactical actions and playing strategy cards can be as much as 90% of the game. They allow to trade, build technology, produce units, go to war, initiate politics, and even hide like a coward. However, there are three other type of actions, well kind of four, which a player can do during the action phase. There is the transfer action. This is almost identical to the tactical action, except with a few differences. First, it is only used for adjacent systems you own already, and never for war. Second, 
you activate one system with a command token from your command pool on one of the systems, and the other command token comes from your reinforcements pile, so you aren't using two from your race sheet, only one. Third, it is meant to transfer units between two systems in one action for peaceful movement, and then production of units if you wish. So really, think of it as a special tactical action you can use in specific instances. The five steps of the transfer action are 1. Activate the two systems 2. Movement 3. PDS fire 4. Planetary landings 5. Production Again, you cannot perform the transfer action on systems you do not control. Systems that don't have your fleet already there. After activation, you can move ships between systems. Movement follows all the same rules as before. Then, check if enemy players have PDS that are in range of your activated systems, often through tech upgrades. If so, they can fire on units moving in the system and remove casualties. Next, do any planetary landings on friendly planets only. Cannot land on neutral or hostile planets. Finally, in the transfer action, you can produce at space docks on only one of the activated systems, which must contain at least one space dock. Other than the transfer, tactical, and strategic actions which are listed in the main rulebook, there are two kinds of special actions. During the course of the game, you will collect action cards. Some actions may be activated at specific times in the game, while some can be played as an action. Instead of taking one of the three normal actions, you may, may use an action card which says, use as an action, then simply follow what the card says. The other special action is specific to certain races. Some races have special powers which can be activated as actions with some sort of limitation. If you have a special rule for your race which states use this as an action, then use that particular power instead of a normal action for that turn and do as the power says. Finally, if a player has played at a minimum all of their strategy cards during this game round, they can choose to pass. They may be forced to pass too if they have no more command pool command tokens and no racial actions or action cards available, then they too can pass. A player that is passed can still activate PDS, can still defend themselves if attacked, can still vote in politics, more on that later, and can still participate in secondary abilities of strategy cards. But, as for taking actions, that player is skipped and cannot take any more direct actions. Once all players have passed, the action phase for that game round is now over. It's on to the status phase. The final phase of the game round is the status phase. This phase is used for doing all the cleanup actions of the game round, plus checking if there is a winner to the game. The status phase follows the following sub-steps. 1. Qualify for public and secret objective cards. 2. Repair damaged ships. 3. Remove command counters from the board. 4. Refresh planet cards. 5. Receive one action card and two command counters from the reinforcements. 6. Redistribute command counters in the command areas of each player's play race sheet. 7. Return strategy cards. Players first can qualify for objective cards as long as they control all of their home system planets. They can claim one face-up public objective card and or their secret objective card. You can only claim each objective card once during the game, but you can choose to qualify for any of the face-up public objective cards that you have not scored yet in the game. You can also qualify only once for your secret objective card during the game. You qualify for objectives in order of play, otherwise known as the initiative order. So the player with the lowest numbered strategic card claims objectives first, and then continue from player to player in the initiative order. To claim the objective, make sure you have the requirements on the card. State that you are claiming the objective, place one of your control markers, your flag tokens, from your reinforcements onto the public objective card you are claiming, and move the control marker on the score track up the number of points indicated on the objective card. Claiming a secret objective is exactly the same, but instead of placing a control marker on the card, simply reveal and flip over the secret objective card in your player area near the race sheet. No one else can claim your secret objective as everyone has their secret objective. Then move your score up the score track appropriately. If any player gets to 10 points or more, they immediately win the game! Once the objective cards have been claimed and there is no winner, you need to continue the rest of the steps of the status phase. Any damaged ships are immediately repaired by putting them from their sides right side up. Then each player removes all of their command counters on the board and places them inside the reinforcement piles. Then all planet cards are refreshed and no longer exhausted. Each player then receives one action card distributed in order from the speaker in a clockwise fashion and they receive 
two command counters from the reinforcement area to place inside of any of their command areas. Then, each player can rearrange their command tokens on their command areas in any configuration they desire. However, if their fleet limit is too low, they may have to destroy capital ships in any system their fleets occupy to drop down to the maximum fleet supply. Finally, each player must return their strategy cards into the common area. There you have it. That is the entirety of a game round. But you're asking, Ross, didn't you promise trade, technology, intrigue, and being rewarded for being a complete coward too? Is this game only war and production? Yes, you too can win in many other ways than just conquest. In fact, conquest of your enemies alone may backfire on you very badly. That's because of the strategy cards, which I only briefly discussed, but now want to discuss each of the eight strategy cards that come with the base game. I do want to stress to you that there are more strategy cards in the expansions, some of which are a lot of fun. However, these can be fun in the right hands and the right group as well. So let's take a look. The first strategy card is Initiative. As you can guess, its main purpose is to get the Speaker Token. This allows you to pick the strategy token first next game round. As well, you get to enact secondary abilities of strategy cards without spending command tokens from the strategic allocation. You cannot pick this card two game rounds in a row, and you don't have to activate this token during the game. As well, Initiative does get you first in the Initiative Order for anything that requires you to do anything in order of Initiative. That is really important. The second strategy card is the Diplomacy card. You and one opponent can't activate each other's systems, and you can't attack each other, except for upgraded PDS units. Yes, if that scary Sardak Noor player or that aggressive Mentak player is pestering you, you can always shield yourself and laugh at their large, useless armies, until the day you decide not to take this strategy card, or activate it too late and get crushed. But it is an excellent choice if you need that quick defense. The secondary ability of is that players can refresh up to two non-home world planets for a command token. That can be very useful and timely for other players not using the diplomacy card. The third strategy card is the political card. This allows you to gain three action cards, a command token, and then resolve the top card from the political deck. Do as the card says and then each player can vote on its effects. When resolving political cards, the card may state it is to elect someone. Each player uses their current unexhausted planet's influence as votes to elect someone or some planet, whatever the card says to elect, of their choosing at the time of the vote. Influence can be found at the bottom right hand of the planet card. While other political cards, uh, players simply vote for or against the political card at hand. If the card is a law card, the re effects remain permanent until a card or ability removes the law in play. If the card has effects for, for or against results of the vote, then resolve them. This is politics, after all, so feel free to bribe people with promises or trade goods. No deal is binding, so feel free to backstab as you see fit as well. It is fun to roleplay as your race. Be as noble, as conniving as you can be. Just remember, every player has a minimum of one vote, even if every planet the player owns is exhausted. Using influence for voting does not exhaust the planets. Players may choose to abstain from voting and not ha have their influence go towards the vote. Finally, if there is ever a tie, even if it is a tie of zero, the player with the speaker token breaks the tie. Now is a good time to explain the golden rule in this game. When a technology, action, political card, or another ability or effect seems to contradict the main rules, follow the card, technology, or ability instead of the main rules. As you can see, there is almost always an exception to every rule which you will learn with experience. And isn't that what is really fun about games? Using the rules to your advantage for gain. Back to the political card instructions. Once you've resolved the political card, it's time to pick the next political card. The player who played the political card draws three cards and puts on top of the political deck the card they wish to be resolved the next time the political strategy card is drawn. The other two go onto the bottom of the deck. Everyone else can activate the secondary power of drawing an action card by trading in a command counter from their strategy allocation. Four strategy card is very straightforward. It is logistics. Play it to gain four command counters from your reinforcements and put anywhere on your command areas of your race sheet. The secondary power uh, players may exhaust plans to use your influence to gain a command counter. Three influence required for each command counter you gain. You may spend trade goods as well. Note, 
you do not need to spend a command counter to use this secondary ability. Otherwise, it'd be pretty useless. The fifth strategy card is Trade. This uses the player's trade contract cards. Each player has two of these cards which they can swap with another player and earn trade goods in the game. The player who uses the Trade strategy card can choose one of the following. Walk first, get three trade goods, gain trade goods for trade contracts they have with other players, then open negotiations for players. However, any two partners who want to trade must get approval by the player who played the strategy card. No player can trade away a trade contract that doesn't belong to them. No player will have more than two trade contracts. Or the second activation ability is to cancel all trade contracts and all players get their trade contracts back to them. The secondary ability allows all other players to pay a command counter to gain trade goods from their active trade agreements that were not formed this action. Whenever a player gains trade goods from the trade contract, they gain trade goods from the common area equal to the number on the trade contract owned by opposing players. Never gain trade goods from your own trade contracts if you are still holding on to them. You only gain the amount as from other players and their trades, and only equal to the amount that is on the trade card that they gave you. The sixth strategy card is Warfare. Its primary ability allows you to take any token on an activated system and return it to your command pool. Why is this great? It means that a fleet that moved, attacked, or pr was produced can now get another activation. The secondary ability of Warfare strategy card allows you to spend a single strategy command counter to move one or two destroyers or cruisers anywhere on the board to an adjacent non-empty system each. A command counter can be put from your reinforcements onto each destination system. The seventh strategy card is the technology card. The primary power allows you to gain a technology you have the required technologies for. It could be of any color. Simply take the card from your technology deck and place it face up in your player area. When a player gains a technology, the player gains the benefits of the technology immediately. The secondary ability is that all players can also gain a technology, but must spend a command counter from the strategy allocation area, plus 8 resources. Again, the players can only gain the technology they have the requirements for. If the player exhausts planets which have the technology speciality, as shown on the symbol and color on the bottom of the, the planet card, that matches the technology the player wishes to gain. The cost is reduced by one for each planet with the same technological speciality. The final strategy card is the Imperial strategy card. This is how objectives become public. The active player draws the top objective. If it's the Imperium Rex card, the game is immediately over. Otherwise, place it face up in the public objectives pile. Finally, the active player gains two victory points immediately. The secondary power allows players to build units at one system with space docks, regardless if it has been activated or not. Building units in this manner does not activate the system, but does require a command counter from the strategy allocation area to be spent. We have gone through now how the game is played, strategy cards, and most of the rules. However, I would be remiss to miss out on a few miscellaneous rules regarding units, special tiles, and other rules. There are a maximum number of trade goods, command counters, and all plastic units, except for fighters and ground forces. If you run out of plastic units, command counters, or the common area runs out of trade goods, you cannot get any anymore for any reason. However, fighters and ground units can have as many units in for a player as long as they have at least one plastic model to place on the stacks of fighter and or ground unit tokens, respectively. However, if you don't have enough plastic fighters or ground units to place on another stack, then you cannot build any more fighters or ground units respectively. Destroyers have a special rule called anti-fighter barrage. If they're fighting any enemy fighters, destroyers may fire two shots each at their normal strength before the space battles. Only fighters can be removed from this firing round and no units can fire back during this extra firing step. This does not happen before each round of space combat, but it happens before the PDS fire and before space battle begins. Dreadnoughts and War Suns both have sustained damage and perform planetary bombardments. Dreadnoughts can be blocked from bombardment by the presence of a PDS on the planet, while War Suns are not blocked by PDS. For space battles and bombardment, War Suns have three shots each.
Carriers and Warsons have a carrying capacity of 6 units each and can carry all ground units like PDS and ground forces, as well as fighters. Fighters can survive their carrying ship being destroyed if there is enough capacity on another ship in the system. Carrying units cannot pick up ground f or, or fighter units from planets or carrying units in a friendly activated system on their way to another system. War Suns cannot be built until the player has the War Sun technology. Space Docks cannot build units if the space of the system is occupied by enemy units. This is called blockading a system. Home systems are the yellow bordered systems and state what race they belong to. Special systems are red bordered. There are three kinds in the base game. Asteroid fields, nebulas, and supernovas. A player can never travel through an asteroid field unless they have the anti-mass deflector technology. They can never end their movement in an asteroid system for any reason, and it can never be activated. A player can never move through a nebula system, but can activate it to stop in it. All units leaving a nebula system count as movement 1, no matter their normal movement speed or any bonuses. Nebulas provide the defenders of the system a plus 1 to their combat roles in space combat. A supernova system may never be activated and never be passed through. It is strictly impassable. All other systems without any borders are called regular systems. Systems with no planets are called empty systems. Systems with the A and B wormholes are considered adjacent to systems of the corresponding A and B wormhole systems. However, an A wormhole is not adjacent to a B wormhole and vice versa. During the status phase, players may scuttle or destroy their own units any time during the status phase after qualifying for public and secret objectives step is complete. Finally, a player is considered eliminated from the game if they have no more units and control no more planets at any point. The other players continue on playing with no changes to the rules of the game. Well, there you have it, a complete set of rules for how to play Twilight Imperium 3. With this video and the how to set up a game of Twilight Imperium 3, you now know enough rules to play this game, which thousands upon thousands of people have enjoyed playing. In the future, we're going to include more videos on how to play the expansions and other variant rules which you can watch to enhance your experience on playing Twilight Imperium 3. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to add them to the comment section below. Also, check out the description or the video channel below for more links uh, for Twilight Imperium related videos and other games in the future. I am Ross Gustafson, and we at Tesla Volta Games wish you fun and hoped we sparked your interest into playing better games like Twilight Imperium 3. Mm -hmm.